as an introduction, um, e homa tena koto, ena mana ena reo e akuraoranga tira, tena koto. Kote tua tahi, na mihi ki te atua, te wairua o te aroha me te rangi mari e. Kote tua nua, rangi nui e tu, papanuku e takoto ne, tēnā kōrua. Te whare ne, te whare kauhau o te whare wānanga o atauako tēnā koe. Kai tāhu, nā koto te mana whenua, nā mihi tēnā koto. Nā mate, kua haere ki tua i te ārai. Mō e mai, haere, haere, haere. We gather in the presence of God, the spirit of love and peace. I recognise the sky and earth on which we depend and the shelter of this University of Otago building. Kaitahu hold the mana of the land, I greet them. I remember and honour all I did. Te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. Te hunga ora ki te hunga ora. E hoa mā, ko tai mai, no nga haue whā, piki mai, kāke mai, tēnā koto katoa. Nā mai ki tēnei kauhau ne o te hāhi tūhau wiri. Welcome to all of you who've come from Otipoti Dunedin, from around Aotearoa and from across the seas. I'm grateful that you chose to attend this Quaker lecture. Knowing a rangi ahau, ko liki te maunga, ko seven te aua, ko Birmingham te taone. <laughs> Enyari, ko Otipoti te kainga inaene, ko whanaua paki te maunga, ko ofeo te aua, Ko arai te uru te marai. Ko te hāhi tūhau wiri te whānau wairua. Ko Elizabeth Duke toko ingoa. My origins are in Birmingham, looking out on the Licky Hills with waters that feed the River Severn. I now find my home in Dunedin and value my association with arai te uru marai. I identify with Quakers as my spiritual family. The name Te Hahi Tuhawiri was given to us by Timothy Karetu when he was Māori Language Commissioner. And it can be translated as the religious body that takes its stand in the spirit that makes you tremble or quake. Norera tēnā koto, tēnā koto, Tēnā koto katoa. Welcome to you all. I'm very grateful to the yearly meeting of Aotearoa in New Zealand for the opportunity to give this lecture. It's been made possible by the energy and guidance of the Quaker Lecture Committee and by the patient and loving support of my partner, Elizabeth Thompson. Um, wh what I say is a shorter version of what's in the booklet so if anyone was going to try and follow it in the booklet, you'll get lost. <laughs> <laughs> so we're ready for video. Thank you. Can religion speak truth? What an arrogant question. <laughs> what is truth anyway? What do I know of religion and who am I to answer? I'll be speaking soon of myself and of my experience of religion. My approach is that truth goes far beyond statements of belief. We live it, it's incarnate in action, in relationships, and in the nature of all that is. In the course of this discussion, I shall be ranging somewhat widely. Truth in the founding experience of Quakers, how I understand religion and truth, Recognising religious differences, truth in religion and science, and what about magic, 
um, difficult texts as pointers to truth, eco-theology, humility, ethics and religion, including Greek and Roman thinking, and concepts of imagery, myth and mystery. First, a story. The Sultan of Turkey, Mehmed IV, was in camp with his army some 300 years ago, about this time of year. An English woman walked into the camp, requesting access to give the Sultan a message from the Lord God. She was Mary Fisher, a Quaker and former domestic servant, who'd already suffered maltreatment and imprisonment in England and the North American colonies. The visitor, vizier arranged for her to be presented to the Sultan, who had his great men about him in such a manner as he was used to receive ambassadors. Invited through the interpreters to speak, Mary remained in thoughtful silence. He then bade her speak the word of the Lord to them, and not to fear, for they had good hearts and could hear it. He also charged her to speak the word she had from the Lord, neither more nor less, for they were willing to hear it, be it what it would. Then she spoke what was on her mind. We're not told just what Mary said. The Turks hearkened to her with much attention and gravity till she had done. And then, the Sultan asking her whether she had anything more to say, she asked him whether he understood what she said. And he answered, yes, every word, and further said that what she had spoken was truth. Mary later wrote to her Quaker friends, he and all that were about him received ye words of truth without contradiction. They are more near truth than many nations. <laughs> In this narrative are embedded two different senses of truth. The spoken word can be true, but also truth is something to which one can relate to, to which one can be near, that is, something which one can live. Friends would have learnt this from their deep absorption in the Bible. For example, Jesus answered to Pilate, Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Quakers since the 17th century have been rooted in the radical Christian experience of our spiritual ancestors. Truth remains a vital concept for us today. The Quaker meeting in Ramallah, Palestine, declared in 2016, we know the truth and we experience that truth in relationship with you and with the same knowledge that God continues to accompany us, even in our deepest, no, oh, sorry, it should be deepest moments of despair. Uh, now, where I stand, before exploring religion and truth, I want to do talk about where I come from, since I speak from personal experience. I grew up in England in a committed Anglican family, learning religious language from the King James Bible and the Book of Common Prayer, and an intelligent Christianity from an excellent high school teacher. After finding that my first baby now 50, um, <laughs> was not expected at quiet Anglican communion services. I started attending Quaker worship and became a member soon after arriving in Dunedin in 1976. At the University of Otago, I lectured in classics, developing a course in Greek and Roman religion, initially with my late friend and colleague, Chris Earhart. When I speak of religion, I come from within this Quaker, originally Anglican Christian tradition, alongside which I set my acquaintance with Greek and Roman polytheism. This binocular vision was helpful when I followed dialogue of religions during my Otago BD study, 
And I believe it has opened my imagination and respect as I gradually learn more about Māori spirituality, the interrelation of all things with wairua. What do I mean by religion or spirituality? There are many ways of using these terms. I understand spirituality as our relation to what is beyond human, more than human, other than human, and religion as doing spirituality together. So religion involves communal practice. Why ask about truth in religion? Quite early in life, I ceased to take all religious statements literally. The biblical book of Revelation has the poetic description of a throne in heaven um, before the crystal sea, surrounded by worshippers. At some point in my childhood, I decided that this was not in the sky, <laughs> but could indeed be contained in a leaf. Um, probably a first struggle to conceive of the non-material or abstract. As an adult, I'm engaged in a continuing process of translating and interpreting religious statements and practices to find meaning which both honours the original and rings true to me. After 50 years with Quakers, among them is where I find a place to search for truth. And these people are my companions in that search. Truth and universalism in religion. Human religions cannot all be expressing the complete truth about our relation to what is beyond human, since there are conflicts between their teachings. This fact is somewhat sometimes used as an argument that religion cannot contain truth and so should be discarded. The contention is not logical. If I assert that the earth is flat and you assert that it is roughly spherical, our disagreement does not prove that neither of us is right. It's possible that we're both wrong, but other means of investigation are needed to discover this. So that's the simple logical structure. An alternative approach is to take one religion as completely true and to hold others in error when they disagree with it. Such loyalty can lead to faithfulness and heroism. Exemplified by the Christian martyr Polycarp, who was called on by the Roman authorities to honour the guardian spirit of the emperor and to curse Christ or to be executed. 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Similarly, the first generations of Quakers were convinced that they had been led into all truth. They took a stand against what they saw as apostate churches and against state control and exploitation of religion. Four of them were hanged by the Puritan authorities in Boston, and several hundred died in the appalling prison conditions in Britain. From 1682, the London Yearly Meeting, the national body, annually asked its quarterly meetings to report what friends, imprisoned for their testimony, have died in prison since the last yearly meeting? Their conviction of truth led these early Quakers into intolerance of other churches, which we hope we do avoid today. Loyalty to one religion can lead to narrow-minded ignorance, to arrogance, cruelty and persecution. And religious passion can be exploited as an ally to national, racial, class or party conflict for power. As I explained, I grew up in the Christian faith and have found my home in the Quaker tradition and practice. 
It has been a privilege and an education to study classic Christian theology, which originates, I believe, in people's attempts to make sense of their experience. But other faith traditions also strive to make sense of experience. And I cannot believe that Christianity is the only one that gets it right. <laughs> I'm not a universalist, at least not someone who holds that all religions are equally true and <coughs> valid. Am I a, a Christian? My spiritual life is shaped by Christian literature and thought, though I would find it hard to give verbal assent to much of the creeds. My ethics are founded on what we learn of the teaching of Jesus and have grown outwards from this root. When visiting Quakers in various countries, I've spoken of following in the footsteps of Jesus. But my discipleship is experiential rather than dogmatic. When trying to speak of faith, I found the words, a pulse of love at the heart of the universe, metaphorical, not literal, and e an expression of trust rather than understanding. In summary, I would say that all religions, and indeed all philosophies, incorporate some form of the search for truth and its expression. My Quaker faith is the way in which I'm called to search, so that to me it speaks truth in ways which other faiths do not. What do I mean by truth? It's time to explore further. The founding Quaker understanding of truth. Truth in religion goes far beyond literal statements of fact. Mary Fisher was one of the first generation of Quakers convinced in the late 1640s and 1650s. These people, among others during the English Civil War and its aftermath, sought a religious expression of the divine presence in and among them and they sought to restore the faith taught by Jesus and his followers. Truth was both what they taught and what they lived. The Quaker Peace Declaration of 1660 is grounded on it. The spirit of Christ which leads us into all truth will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for the kingdoms of this world. So we, in obedience to his truth, do not love our lives unto the death, that we may do his will and wrong no man in our generation, but seek the good and peace of all men. One of the earliest comprehensive statements of Quaker belief was written by Elizabeth Bathurst in 1679 with the title, Truth's Vindication. Her general description of truth's principle defines the principle <coughs> of truth. Tis the grace of God, tis the light of Jesus, tis a manifestation of the spirit, tis the glad tidings of salvation, tis the word of faith, tis the seed of the kingdom, Tis that stone which hath been rejected by many a foolish builder, but now it is become the head of Zion's corner. For Elizabeth Bathurst and for her Quaker faith community, truth stands for the whole of religion, for human relation to God in Jesus through the Spirit. A note appended to George Fox's journal uses truth to stand for what we might call the Quaker movement. And, quote, in 1656, truth broke forth in America and many other places. <laughs> and still the Lord's truth is over all and his seed reigns and his truth exceedingly spreads unto this year, 1676. Uh, move to religion and science. 
current science-based arguments about religion and truth are not simpl simply populist. They've taught faith communities to distinguish between what is core to their faith and what depends on their culture and time. Religious language can at once employ traditional pictures and carry a more durable meaning. Joseph Addison published the hymn, The Spacious Firmament on High, in 1712. The first line reflects Genesis 1, where the firmament or sky is like a dome over the earth. The hymn concludes by speaking of the stars and planets. What though in solemn silence all move round the dark terrestrial ball? What though nor real voice nor sound amid their radiant orbs be found? In reason's ear they all rejoice and utter forth a glorious voice, forever singing as they shine, the hand that made us is divine. Addison's words represent pictorially Paul's declaration in Romans. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. Addison blends poetically these echoes of Genesis and Paul with the science of his time, the earth is spherical, with everyday perception, the stars and planets appear to move around the earth, and his governing criterion is reason, the foundation of intellectual life in his time. He deploys pictorial imagination to point a truth which he describes as divine creation, and which in our day might be awe at the immensity and intricacy of the physical universe. An apparent conflict between science and religion is not new. Greek thinkers in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE began to involve physical explanations for physical phenomena rather than attributing causation to the gods. This is parodied in Aristophanes' comedy, Clouds, where the modern thinker, Socrates, explains that rain is caused by clouds colliding and spilling their contents, mm -hmm. to which the rustic traditionalist responds, I really used to think Zeus was pissing <laughs> through a sieve. <laughs> in science itself, truth can be multi-layered. The first test of a nuclear explosive device was on 16th of July, 1645, in the New Mexico desert. No, I don't, sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let us say 1945. <laughs> um, from it was derived much factual evidence about the process and impact of the explosion, truth about cause and effect. J. Robert Oppenheimer, director of the Manhattan Project, spoke later about his personal reaction. We knew the world would not be the same. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This is truth in another dimension. What did the dropping of the two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki mean? For those responsible, for the victims, for all of us who now live in a world scarred by these events. If scientists are pursuing truth, they need to recognise the potential of their results once these are out of their control. The full truth embodied in science includes choices and consequences, ethical and existential dimensions. Religion, science and magic. While religion and science can be set in conflict with one another, 
they stand together in relation to another approach to what is beyond human, magic. I've defined religion as doing spirituality together and spirituality as relating to what is beyond human, more than human, other than human. But science also relates to this. Both disciplines seek to understand the nature of the universe in which we live and how things happen. They give explanations, they seek truth. Science, adopted by technology, moves from understanding to action. It attempts to give us ways of how to manage our lives and to govern our involvement in the world around us. Religion also moves from understanding to action. What about magic? Magic is certainly focused on action. It seeks to bring about results. Its great difference from either religion or science is that it lacks humility. Science has humility before the truth. Experimental results and hypotheses are presented for others to test and assertions are unacceptable without reliable evidence. One of the earliest forms of human scientific endeavour is medicine. The grounds for humility are concisely put by Hippocrates, a Greek doctor in the 5th century BCE. Life is short and the art is long. The critical moment is urgent. Experiment is dangerous and judgment difficult. And I, I, I will pass over a discussion of religious treatments of ep epilepsy because we're running low on time. But some of these treatments were magical. And the concluding words here, the divine power has been overcome and forced into subjection by the human will, are an exact definition of the goal of magic. So, summarising the question of the king's touch, where sufferers from scrofula were brought to the monarch to be healed of the disease, um, this was believed to extend a long way. Um, we hear of a prescription of water in which 13 King Charles I farthings had been previously boiled. I would also say that the practice of indulgences, as objected to by Martin Luther, fits the definition of magic because a human authority is trying to control the divine pattern of sin and redemption. So where does truth come into this? I think magic is not concerned with truth. It may have actual effects so psychosomatically, for healing or for a sense of being cursed. And some practitioners believe that their powers are real. Some of those accused of magic were probably genuine herbalists and so practicing pharmacy. However, in itself, magic is inauthentic, not rooted in truth. I, I'm taking the first four chapters of Genesis to look at ways in which a religious text can hold various layers of truth. Um, these chapters evolved over time, reflecting the experience of different groups within the people of Israel. And uh, you, you have a, a summary up here. I'm actually going to go backwards and omit the last part, the second half of chapter four. Um, I'm going backwards partly because the first chapter looks like the latest written, but also because if you move in this sequence, you have a progression from the development of human society through consideration of how things go wrong to a search for truth about our place on the earth and finally about our place in the universe. In what ways, if any, do these stories speak truth? Um, second, first half of chapter four, 
Cain was angry because God had accepted Abel's sacrifice of meat, but not Cain's offering of crops. Without trying to see this as literal truth with an apparently unfair God, the story raises the tormenting questions of how humans come to hate and wrong one another and the possibility of living with and overcoming our wrongdoing. And John Steinbeck's novel, East of Eden, treats the theme powerfully, concluding in hope. The truth in Genesis is not, is not in historicity, but in the inner meanings the story conveys. Um, Cain's action receives absolute moral condemnation, but going backwards, it's more puzzling to evaluate the actions of Eve and Adam. When Genesis 3 opens, God has created the human and animals from the earth and the female as a partner to the male. They are in the garden which he has planted and are to till it, but not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The crafty snake now persuades the woman that God has deceived them and that the fruit will give them power. You will be like God. Both humans eat the fruit, become ashamed of their nakedness and hide from God, who comes walking in the garden, challenges and condemns them. So that the humans do not eat from the tree of life and become immortal, they are driven out of the garden. If we read this story literally, it sounds exactly like entrapment. God creates the humans and chooses to put them in a garden where he's planted a tree from which they must not eat. <laughs> Among the creatures, he's created the snake, enabling it to speak and to turn the humans against his command. Now, obviously, none of those who developed and transmitted the story intended to present a malevolent God. What did the humans do to deserve punishment? Milton begins his great epic, Paradise Lost, with his subject of man's first disobedience. Those who developed and transmitted the story of the forbidden fruit saw disobedience at the root of the fall, and it's embedded in the history of Israel. God questions the man, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? One may object to this interpretation as a reflection of a patriarchal and authoritarian society. There are, can be feminist interpretations that the woman is resisting dominance and choosing to be fully human. After all, she has done her research. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. This story overall also depicts imperfect human nature. But so there are many ways of finding meaning and so truth in the story. One terrible distortion from seeing the story as literally true is the centuries-long condemnation of women as the source of evil since the woman gave the fruit to the man. These Genesis stories are exemplars of myths, stories which offer truth beyond the literal narrative. Before the story of how things go wrong, Genesis gives their original setting God is actively involved in the creation of the human, moulding the body from the earth and actually breathing into it the breath of life. God also plants a garden and forms the animals. I read in this an assertion that what is beyond, other than human, is intimately involved with the material world and so the material is sacred, incarnate. The creation story in Genesis 2 poses a central challenge to us in the focus on the human who is first created, then a garden is planted, 
Then the animals are molded. Do we interpret this to mean everything is there for our sake and for the use of humanity? Or do we see a reflection of our responsibility as beings who can study the past and present and look to the future and who can develop powerful technology? Our responsibility to care for all life and the planet on which it is set. The questions are also raised by the chronologically later account of creation, which the compiler set as the first chapter of Genesis, the first words of Torah or the books of Moses. In the beginning, Genesis opens, when God created the heavens and the earth. The six successive days of creation are followed by the Sabbath rest on the seventh. Today, these words have become a focus for anger as irrational as that of Cain against Abel. I agree that the story was never intended to be taken literally, but to embody mythically or by metaphor truths about the universe and our place in it. The Jewish scholar Jacob Neusner explains one form of midrash study of scripture, which he describes as midrash as parable. The exegete or interpreter reads scripture in terms other than those in which the scriptural writer speaks. Scripture, for instance, may tell the story of the love of man and woman in the Song of Songs, but Judaic and Christian exegetes heard the song of the love of God and Israel, or God and the church. I'm trying to read the early part of Genesis through a similar lens. So, uh, truth and eco-theology. Genesis 1 is told in poetic patterning. Each act of creation comes purely through the word of God, and God said. We hear repeatedly, and God saw that it was good, concluding, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. There are many ways of finding truth in the story. One, for me, is the basis of eco-theology, that we humans are an integral part of a whole good and unified system of life and its supports, and have responsibility to it. Unity in a good world is also embodied in the older creation story in Genesis 2. The second myth, Genesis 2, calls us to live truly in our place on the earth. The first calls us to live truly in our place in the universe. There we are, little blue dot. Behind the stories is a sense of truth, of being human in a world we did not make and on which we depend. And I I in the booklet, I use Blake's poem, Jerusalem, as an example of seeing the divine in the everyday and working through the distortion of the divine by cruelty and greed to an attempt not just to see Jerusalem in the past, but to build and live Jerusalem. So, um, ethics and truth in religion. In English, we often use true as equivalent to good. A true friend, my true love. Truth in religion merges into a wider concept, integrity. Integrity is wholeness in thought, word and action. Integrity lies behind the imagery in Jesus saying, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. A very early Christian writing, the Didache, or teaching of the 12 apostles, uses truth to stand for both ethical teaching and ethical action. 
Every prophet who teaches the truth, if they do not practice what they teach, is a false prophet. Paul, too, understands truth as good action. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Greeks in the classical period did not treat their religion as the foundation of moral values. And some thinkers raised moral objections to the stories of the gods, arguing that either the stories were untrue or that the gods had no concern for our world or that they did not exist. The Greek gods were angry if their privileges were abused rather than if people were immoral or cruel. The one major exception was the cult of Zeus, the protector of strangers, travellers, guests, suppliants and beggars. The cult had social value for small communities desperate to control their borders and their resources. Without such supernatural protection, who would travel? The Hebrew scriptures instead give a historical justification for the protection of the stranger. You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Romans believed that the gods had an overall impact on human life in maintaining the structure of society rather than in controlling moral behaviour. Jupiter was the Roman counterpart of Zeus. Cicero says of him, Jupiter is called best and greatest, not because he makes us just or sober or wise, but healthy and rich and prosperous. <laughs> Religion in its various forms, polytheism recognising a number of divine powers, or monotheism recognising a single divinity, approaches the universal human ethical questions of why the world is as it is and how we are to live in it. Polytheism faces the question of evil, why do things go wrong, by seeing, for example, one divinity promoting war and one promoting peace. But polytheism has problems with the question of good. What is right if divine impulses conflict? Monotheism sees the one divinity as the source of good, but continues to struggle with the problem of evil. How can it exist if the one God is all goodness? Non-theists, atheists or humanists share the universal human need for ethical answers. Can religion point to truth? Ethics is only one aspect of truth. Without humility, how can we attain any sort of truth? When I was studying Greek history, I made an assertion in an essay without factual grounding. My tutor, an international expert, could have said, that's plain wrong because of this or that evidence. Or, in proper educational terms, she could have said, go away and see if you can find evidence to support it. Instead, she dived into her bookshelves and brought out various sources to see whether she could actually find grounds for my claim. You might say she was wasting her time, but that example of humility in search for the truth is still with me more than 50 years later. I find an answer to my question, can religion speak truth? In the words of the early Quaker, Isaac Pennington, all truth is a shadow, except the last, except the utmost. Yet, every truth is true in its kind. It is substance in its own place, though it be but a shadow in another place. For it is but a reflection from an intenser substance. And the shadow is a true shadow, as the substance is a true substance. I understand from Pennington's image that we can find pointers to the last, the utmost. 
using human language and concepts. We're in the sphere of imagery, metaphor, myth or story. In the end, we find ourselves in mystery, in that which is hidden. Humility admits our limitations. Hippocrates said of science, life is short and the art long. His contemporary Protagoras recognised the same of religion. Concerning the gods, I cannot know whether they exist or do not exist. Many things hinder knowledge, both the obscurity of the subject and the shortness of human life. Back to Pennington. Mystery points to what is beyond our knowing and to what is beyond reason. Nevertheless, we cannot search for truth in religion without rationality. We need to follow reason and to go beyond reason. Can religion speak truth? Religious thought, expressions, faith and practices can speak truth only if we live the truth in ethical integrity and humility. Humility recognises that we know in part while being content that the last, the utmost, is mystery. Do we trust that truth hidden in mystery will in time be revealed? Paul reassures his converts, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. The writer of 1 John also looks for a final revelation. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. I would rather accept that the last, the utmost, is with us now and be content in the mystery. In human experience, God can be found as a personal friend, as the depth of all being, as supreme power, as absent or as non-existent. As Pennington said, each of these can be substance in its own place, authentic experience, even though they are shadows of the last, the utmost. It may be that the mystery is completely beyond us. If we seek the achievable truths, which are a shadow of the last of the utmost, what we seek or find is truth enough. We do not know what Mary Fisher told the Sultan, but in the end it does not matter. Both Mary and her hearers found truth in it. We can both continue seeking and rest in the mystery. Isaac Pennington reassures us, and the end of words is to bring people to the knowledge of things beyond what words can utter.